And welcome to you all um, to this MEXA conference. I love the uh, title of Transformative Practice and Theory, where we stand today. So I hope I can speak uh, to this theme and um, open up, I hope, some interesting uh, discussions, conversations and questions. Um, I'm actually going to share work in progress, so I kind of thought this would be a nice context to share my current project, so it's not worked out. Um, I'd be very, very happy to receive any feedback if you, if you feel generous enough, um, as long as it's not scathing critique. You can, <laughs> you can save that for each other and uh, we'll tweet it. Um, so I'm going to share my current project, so it's called Haunted Data. Uh, social media, weird or queer science. I'm not really sure um, which adjective to use yet, so that might be something to reflect on. And archives of the future, which is a nod or gesture to uh, Derrida's work on the archive and archive fever. And it will become clear, I hope, um, how Derrida's been influencing my project. And this, this is one of the controversies that I'm following um, within across social media, but following's a little bit passive, so I'm going to put following in speech marks for the moment, um, because I'm, I'm trying to actively shape and intervene within a particular science controversy that's taking form uh, across social media. It's been tweeted about, blogged about, posted on Facebook. Um, it's caught the attention of broadcast media. Uh, newspaper periodicals, particularly uh, New York Times, The Guardian, The Telegraph, um, even Al Jazeera News. Um, and yes, it involves this uh, man on the right who's a, a Yale cognitive scientist, John Barr. And do you know who this is on the left? Any of you? No. This is Hans the Horse. Have you heard of Hans the Horse? Yeah. So Hans the Horse was a, a, an equine celebrity um, in the late 19th, the early 20th century. So he could apparently tell the time or solve complex multiplication puzzles by stamping his hooves. And this is his trainer, Mr. Von Austin. And essentially the controversy really relates to a comparison that was made between John Barr and Mr. Von Austin. And this comparison really angered John Barr. So he, he went on a rant um, by posting two blogs on Psychology Today. So he blogs for Psychology Today, but his blog had remained <coughs> dormant for two years. Um, and he resurrected himself through the blog in order to have a rant about this comparison that was made with Mr. Von Austin. And then he later... Or, or quite quickly actually took the blog post down. So that's, kind of, so that's essentially the story. So ho hopefully a little bit of dramatic tension because I'm going to come back or not, but I'm going to come back to the controversy later. And, and hopefully, although you might think, mm, I'm me media and cultural studies, media and communications, this isn't necessarily that interesting to think about science and particularly cognitive science actually some of the ideas and concepts and psychological theories that John Barr has developed have, have really influenced media and communications and media and cultural studies. So particularly the concept of priming, the idea that we can be made to move by someone or even something else by human and non-human agencies. And that's obviously a, a very ubiquitous cultural imaginary but has also taken on different technological forms. So we live this in different ways. So it, it is very interesting, and I hope to convince you why. Um, okay, so hopefully, yes, brilliant. So uh, there's three parts to the lecture then. The first is I'm gonna kind of give you a sense of what my data is. So what am I working with within a digital environment? Um, and I'm particularly working with what's come to be known as post-publication peer review. So have you heard of this? Yeah, PPPR. If you haven't, it's definitely coming your way. Um, and you might be um, 
the architects, in a sense. Many of you, I'm sure, are very used to tweeting, posting on Facebook. Uh, and post-publication peer review is what happens to published journal articles and books post-publication where they can be tweeted about, posted on Facebook, blogged about, um, and people might respond in comments on websites. And this is particularly salient within science, so post-publication peer review has become a real issue for scientists. So they're worried about it, they're worried about the public communication of science, because of course this is data that's publicly available. So if you have access to uh, the internet, some know-how, uh, and tenacity as well, you need a certain amount of tenacity, you can actually find out quite a lot about the controversies within science, and I find that really interesting. I've always been interested in controversies and science controversies, what isn't settled. Um, so my data is post-publication peer review, so I've been following what happens to actually two different published journal articles once they've been published and people start tweeting about them, <coughs> blogging about them and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, scientists are threatened by this. For many, uh, PPPR potentially could threaten the integrity of science. For others, of course, it's publicity. It's a good way of attracting attention, capturing attention. Um, and if you don't know, at, at least within the humanities, and, and this is rather depressing, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint the bleak picture, then I'm going to try and give you hope. Most journal articles are, are, are what uh, publishers call zero citations. I don't know if you're aware of this. Most journal articles never get cited. So how depressing is that? Um, and of course, the number of times journal articles are cited contributes to the impact factor of journals. So journals that are high ranking have high impact factors, more of the papers are cited. But it's still only a very small percentage of papers. So you can see why, of course, for, for an academic, increasingly within the kind of audit uh, culture we live in within the academy, the strategic use of social media might be seen to be important, so it might be something you want to engage in because you want uh, your work to be read, to be cited, to be appropriated, and so on and so forth. So for many scientists you can see the strategic use of social media is important, whilst at the same time often scientists are accused of engaging in personal branding, uh, self-commodification, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. So you have to sort of negotiate that tension, which we all do, don't we, within, uh, when we use social media, you don't want to be seen to be engaging in personal branding or using social media strategically. So really, how do you negotiate that tension? Okay, um, let me just make sure I haven't missed anything out. So I, I, I think PPPR is really interesting and it is coming our way. Um, so more and more uh, publishers are using metrics, measures of social media impact following the publication of journal articles. Uh, so one metric that's being used by a publisher that, I, uh, that I'm associated with in, in a journal I edit is alt metrics. So they're really excited, they want to map and track the impact of a published uh, article uh, within and across different social media platforms. And then they're trying to correlate or associate uh, that reach, um, I forgot what I was going to say now, I often do this, they're trying to correlate that reach with citation. And of course it's only ever a correlation or an association. So you can see why this might be of interest to us within the humanities. As I said, it is coming our way, whether we like it or not. Um, so that's PPPR then. Um, so the whole idea then is it's about measuring the reach and traction of a, pu of a published article or book 
post-publication across different social media platforms. And so this is my data. This is what I've started with. So I'm trying to follow the trails, the afterlives of uh, journal articles once they've been published. And it is actually very, very interesting. Um, and that's what I want to try and convince you about. Um, one of the very interesting things I think about PPPR is it really makes visible citational politics. So what kind of practices and politics go into making a highly cited paper? And of course, as I'm sure you're aware, this is, this is as much about already existing relationships of prestige, status, and hierarchy. So the, for me, although that's rather bleak, because it makes, I think it makes very visible what we all know, um, <laughs> that, you know, that we're governed by very sexed, race, class, and gender politics within the academy, I think we can read against the grain of these kinds of predictive metrics and analytics. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to open up something that in a sense makes visible and exposes what we know and I'm trying to read against the grain in order to um, create what I'm calling mediated perception, a kind of distributed perception which allows us to see what usually might remain more submerged, more invisible, uh, that's often disqualified and disavowed. So, so that's the kind of idea. Um, right, let me just make sure, yeah. I think I've said of this. I mean, one of the things also, um, just to, to foreground gender as well, um, in the context of PPPR, often feminist academics who use social media, as we know, are often uh, might attract the potential for abuse, uh, harassment, trolling, and flame wars. So, you know, we, we know that the use of social media and perhaps the strategic use of social media isn't neutral in any way. Okay, so this um, is a statement about the politics of post-publication peer review uh, from a recent blogger who writes for the Scientific American. So they say, new scientists have grown up commenting on their friends' pictures, their silly comments on Facebook, and their favourite YouTube videos. Will this practice carry over into their scientific publishing? Will publishers eventually link back to these commenting systems? The answer is yes. This is what uh, they're trying to do. And of course, there are lots of commercial services emerging which are trying to extract value from these measures of academic value or so-called so measures of academic value. Uh, will database producers, i.e. Scopus Web of Science, incorporate user comments into their systems? Again, there's lots of debate about this, but I think the answer is, is, is yes. Um, it will be interesting to find the answers to these questions and see how these systems impact scholarly scientific communication. So you can imagine the idea that all these trails, although often, as I said, often uh, journal articles do completely disappear, but if an article is tweeted about, posted about, blogged about, the idea that this commentary, this dis distributed and hyperlinked commentary, will then be linked back to the article, um, I think is potentially of concern, potentially of interest. And I'm quite interested, actually, in what you think about this, because I think this is, this is going to more and more shape the academy and, I think, the, the academic publishing environment. Um, now, also, PPPR... It, it, as, I, as I've um, indicated, it's a judgment, an evaluation of academic value, of your worth and status, potentially, as an academic. Um, so there are all kinds of quantification tools um, which are working, attempting to track, map this data, and then provide a score, some kind of measure of value of your reach and traction. And I think this is, this is all the more insidious when we view this alongside the rise of a host of self-quantification tools 
which aggregate individual social media data and provide a score which purports to measure value and impact or even influence. So the idea of being a driver of influence, this kind of term is often used, uh, particularly by social media services who are aggregating data in this way. What does that mean to be a driver of influence? Um, I found there's a really interesting article by Carolyn Gerlitz and, and Celia Lurie that was published last year in the journal Distinction. Um, if you don't know this, looking at the rise of these self-quantification tools. And they call these participative measures of value. So in other words, they don't just provide a measure. Potentially, they encourage or incite people to strategically participate in order to increase their score. And I think we can all, all already see this. Um, I mean, I'm not going to name names, but I'm associated with a blog for two journals, and there are certain people who are definitely using the blog uh, strategically. Um, anyway, we can talk about that later. Um, I find it really uncomfortable, and I think, for me, it is that tension, as I said, between the knowing strategic use and then an article being genuinely interesting. And um, they're not always the same thing, I think. Okay, um, so within, uh, to associate PPPR with these self-aggregating tools, um, there is a commercial value being given to uh, the idea that you can drive influence. So within these kinds of uh, self-aggregated tools that I think all metrics and some of the other measures of PPP are associated with, there are these kind of anticipated targets where you can win prizes. And of course, uh, with an article, it is about citation, the number of times an article is cited. And as we know, and, and Roger Burroughs has written about this and many others, we increasingly within the academy live in this kind of audit culture where everything is measured. I'm sure you've heard of the H index. Have you heard of this? Um, at at, at uh, American conferences, often American academics walk around with their H index on a badge, which is supposedly a measure of their influence. So the, these are rankings. These are ways in which academics are ranked in relation to each other. And of course, they do become important for promotion um, and for your rise through uh, the academy. Okay, um, so for me, PPPR is likely to contribute further uh, to what Ros Gill calls the hidden injuries of academic life in the neoliberal academy, um, where the complexity and stresses of what counts as academic value and its various measures and metrics are now a ubiquitous part of life in what she calls the neoliberal academy. So, Okay. And as well as various software tools which allow academics to tell a story about their own publication peer review, so there are, there are already um, uh, measures that you can use, visualisation tools such as Storify, which allow you to curate your own data. So I'm sure you'll, you'll all be aware of this uh, much more. Um, so PPR is also then a, a source of capital, uh, e-commerce, uh, and there is the introduction of various alternative metrics and tracking services. So you can see why PPPR might be the subject of lively debate. And as I've said, it's coming our way. Um, now, I, as I said, I, 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 that's a bleak picture because I think that's not, not very hopeful. Um, and for those of you contemplating a career in academia, or perhaps you've already dipped in, or you are in academia, uh, I do want to reach out and give you some hope. So as I've said, I think PPPR can be a source of data which makes visible the inequities and asymmetrical and unequal power relations which govern academic life and which are very much race, class, sexed and gendered. 
Um, they, these are relations of prestige, power, status, and hierarchy, which structure who gets on, who gets helped, who's allowed in, and who gets left out. And I'm interested in how we can expose this using PPPR. So there is a kind of politics of what I'm calling small data uh, that lies behind this. And I'm interested in the kinds of regimes of remembering and forgetting what's remembered, what's forgotten, and how can we remove what becomes submerged and displaced. So, this, so the concept of haunted data that I'm working with then is attempting to remove what becomes displaced and submerged or rendered invisible or forgotten. So it's a kind of active, performative practice in a sense. And it's also one which, um, as I've discovered trying to publish some of this work, does take you into very blurry lines around copyright and legal issues. Um, so I've written something on haunted data, tracking and mapping and intervening within the data trails that have become associated with John Barr. And then I had to remove the visualizations um, of the data. I'd used some open source software, uh, one of which, Topsy, um, has been bought by Apple. And publishers are very wary about publishing any of the data visualizations because of the potential for being sued and legal action. So there's a whole other layer uh, of haunted data to this as well. Okay. Walk into the wall. Um, has anyone got any questions in relation to that part before I move on? Okay, so I'll come back to this um, in the third section. So this is the, the second section of, of the lecture is um, I want to contextualise this concept of haunted data in my current project within um, my interventions in relation to the field of affect uh, studies, um, and particularly in my book, Immaterial Bodies, uh, Affect, Embodiment and Mediation. So how many of you are interested in this field? A few of you. I mean, there's no doubt that there is a huge intensification of work on affect across many fields of studies in the arts, the humanities and social sciences. Um, and uh, I, I've been interested in kind of experiences, phenomenon, that register below the threshold of conscious awareness and attention for a long time. So in a sense, this, my interventions come from a, a long-standing genealogical interest in phenomenon like voice hearing, uh, suggestion, and contagion, uh, and automaticity, for example. So I'm going to talk about this um, affective term, as, it, as it's often referred to, and then relate my current project to this work. So you can see how it really grew out of this work. Um, so as you'll know, the field of affect studies is far from unified. I think that's, that's really, really important. So there's not one affect theory, but there are affect theories which are kind of very mainstreamed in a sense. They've come to speak for this thing that gets called affect. So there's a particular kind of Deleuzean version, which draws on the work of Sylvan Tompkins, for example, which uh, is very popular, particularly within uh, North America. Um, so there are various assumptions made about affect, which you'll know that affect is referring to the somatic, uh, the pre-personal, the autonomous, the sub-personal, the automatic, uh, the pre-programmed, the non-conscious, the non-cognitive. So these are kind of some of the terms and concepts used to describe affect. Um, and I was kind of interested in some of the assumptions made about affect and also genealogically uh, what happens when actually we go back a hundred years and look at the kinds of interests that scientists, philosophers, <laughs> Uh, engineers, uh, 
people working with media technologies and developing what were new technologies at the time, like cinema, uh, radio and the newspaper, were thinking in relation to phenomenon like contagion and suggestion. Um, as I'm sure you know, there was a, a, an assumption, particularly in the 19th century, in the work of people like Gabriel Tard, for example, that um, what constitutes human subjectivity is the capacity for suggestion. So he argued we're all ordinarily suggestible. And of course, these kinds of ideas anyway have become part and parcel of media studies. If you think about media effects discourse, this was engaging with ideas of suggestion, but they were spun in a particular way uh, through the work of, of the, the crowd psychologists writing in the 19th century, uh, Gustave Le Bon, um, who argued that only certain people are suggestible. And this suggestibility was a lack or a deficit. So he understood this through a, a kind of form of primitivism or through evolutionary discourse. So these ideas have been very much with us, but it's only certain groups within media studies who've been seen to be overly suggestible to media influence. So, so in a sense, the interest in contagion and suggestion uh, within the context of media and, and culture studies goes back to the birth of the discipline of media studies. Um, and my interests really are in also some of the critiques that are being made of the turn to affects. There's a lot of critique and counter critique. So uh, you might be aware of the American um, historian of science, Ruth Lee's interventions in her critique of affect theory, which, which was published in the journal uh, Critical Inquiry. And she's talking about one of the assumptions made within the literature that affect is autonomous that comes from the work of Brian Masumi which is that there's a half second delay between action and then conscious thought and intention. So she says that this is an assumption that's made in lots of the, the material, not the material, the literature, that material processes of the body brain generate our thoughts and that conscious thought or intention arrives after a half second delay. So that's very much, you'll see that lots of people make that assumption and a lot is read into that gap. So this is seen to be how we're made to move because there's this gap between, in a sense, reaction or action and then becoming aware. And so for Brian Masumi, for example, draws from particular neuroscientific studies of what's called time delay or time reaction from Leibert. So, um, and often on the basis of that, there's a kind of new materialism that's emerging where, where media scholars are becoming really interested in the neurophysiological body. Um, so this is a good example of research very influenced by these kinds of ideas that's turned to the neurosciences, to the psychological sciences, to understand why we might be moved by film, and particularly why at the cinema specifically we might be moved to tears, or, 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 or to some kind of amorphous feeling that we might not necessarily register as an emotion, we might not necessarily be able to name it. Um, so this film scholar turns to both the neurosciences, so she draws on the concept of mirror neurons, and also the psychological sciences, where she draws on the concept of, or the phenomenon of emotional contagion, to theorise these processes of mediation in the context of film. So you know the phenomenon of emotional contagion is the idea that you can catch someone else's mood that you can kind of walk into a room and feel the atmosphere. Um, and the phenomenon of emotional contagion um, within the psychological sciences has been documented extensively. So there's no doubt that you can catch emotional mood from another. But actually how to understand this process is up for grabs. Uh, but for, for, for much work in contemporary psychology, 
they draw on very evolutionary ideas related to body language or evolutionary understandings of body language. So this is Anne Copland, who's a, a film study scholar, uh, going to the psychological sciences to theorise film. And she says, empirical research in psychology has shown that people tend to automatically and continuously mimic the expressions, vocalisations, postures, movements, and instrumental behaviour of individuals they observe. This goes on at a non-conscious level, and this is an explanation for why film might move us in these kinds of non-conscious registers, the register of feeling, uh, of emotion and affect. Um, so I don't know what you think about that, about this kind of what, what's often called a rapprochement uh, with the neurosciences or the psychological sciences, but many of my colleagues are drawing on psychological ideas and concepts or going to the neurosciences to theorise affect and mediation. Um, another of my colleagues who will remain nameless draws on the idea of the reptilian brain uh, to theorise gaming, for example. Um, so, yeah, uh, another good example of this is the work of Tony Sampson, who's a, a media studies scholar, who's trying to explain the idea of, of what he calls networked virality, how we can understand the reach and traction of a fad, a fashion, a trend, a belief, an emotion across network culture by drawing on the psychological sciences again, and particularly theories of contagion that we find in crowd psychology. Um, now, this is where I have to make a confession. So I trained initially in psychology and became very, very disenchanted with the positivism of psychology and left the discipline. So I find this really curious now that a radical gesture or move being made by many media and culture study scholars is to go to the psychological sciences. And, and Brian Massumi, the radical Deleuzean, does this fairly unproblematically, he does sometimes say, oh, this is speculative, this is, is, this is really imagining what if the world worked in this way or, or, or uh, processes of mediation worked in this way. But nevertheless, the kinds of theories and concepts that he and many others draw on are very mainstream, and I think people are making rather conservative assumptions about subjectivity. Um, so that's why I'm interested in queer, weird science. So, so, so this is where, really this is a plea to you if you're interested in affect, um, if you're interested in subjectivity, which of course you must be, um, if you're interested in embodiment, don't go to the neurosciences or the psychological sciences unproblematically. And I think it's very, very problematic. And I can say more in discussion um, if you want. So, um, one, of the, one of the critiques of this rapprochement with the sciences by, the, by humanity scholars is that we engage in cherry picking. We kind of pick particular theories from psychology or particular concepts and we remain unaware of the circuits of contestation, authorization, leg legitimation within those disciplines and fields of inquiry themselves. So that's one important point. Um, and often, psychology, in the past of media and cultural so studies, psychology has both been scorned and seemed to be something to avoid it, something to be avoided, and yet. I, I think most, if not all, media and cultural, media and cultural study scholars are making uh, conservative or otherwise psychological assumptions in their own work. They might not just be rendered explicit. Okay, so this is why in my own work I go to what I'm calling minor archives. So work in psychology that's been delegitimated, disavowed, disqualified, particularly historically, and this is why I've always been interested in controversies, 
what never quite gets settled within psychology, but psychologists think has gone away, and then the controversies resur resurface, often in new ways. Um, so I've just made this statement here, so I'm particularly interested in what often passes as, as uh, anomalous experiences, aberrant or pathological phenomenon, or puzzling paradoxes within psychology. And this is an archive of, of weird or even queer science. And I argue that sciences of oddities, exceptions, and anomalies deserve much more attention by cultural theorists. So that's my plea in a way, is to try and look at what, what gets disqualified from psychology. And actually what Gary called in his book in 2002, uh, culture and bits, paradoxical discourses. Um, so, yeah, so this picture here is actually Lady, uh, Lady Wonder the Typing Horse. I don't know if you've heard of her. Um, there's some great um, kind of entities that you can find within this literature which raise really interesting questions about this, this, this question of what it means to be moved by someone or something else, which, which I'm particularly interested in. And I can say a bit about Lady Wonder later if you're interested. Um, so yes, as I said, my interest in, in affect studies goes back then to my long-standing interest in what Gary calls paradoxical discourses, just, just to remind him. Uh, those less visible and more perverse discourses and forms of knowledge. And in his book, it's just, just, it's just embarrassing. He refers to how the practices of new media technologies at the time of his writing in the late 1990s, early 2000s, so at the time CDs, VCRs, CD-ROMs, DVDs, mobile phones, computers, printers, faxes, the internet, emails, and so on, were, he argues, challenging the modes through which academic knowledge is legitimated. And he draws on Derrida in his book, which is one of the inspirations for my work on haunted data. And he argues that these, what were new media practices and technologies at the time, have the potential to transform the very content and nature of academic knowledge. So I think writing or working some 13 years later now, PPPR is perhaps testament to Gary's and Derrida's hauntological vision and the need for new methods and forms of academic research, which are able to examine the traces of what academic research might be and indeed could become. So I don't know how much time I've got. I've got a feeling I'm waffling on. Am I all right for a little bit? Yeah, OK. I'll speed up a bit. Um, so I just wanted to say something about hauntology, because the, the, the haunted data I'm working with is both affective and hauntological, and I'm interested in both of these ways of understanding data. So the affective part of the, the data I'm working with is, is both the idea that what takes place within the context of PPPR is often very uncivil discourse. It's very emotional. Um, people have rants. It, it, it kind of includes what's usually excluded from positivist science writing and the published journal article. But the data is also hauntological because it's haunted by ghosts, to use a, a, a kind of figuration that, Mark, um, that Derrida uses in his work on archive fever and spectres of Marx, where he's concerned with what haunts archives theories practices, entities, and processes. Um, so I was rereading Gary's book for this, and I was interested, actually, we were kind of working in parallel, but I didn't read his book then. I'm sure he didn't read my book on Hearing Voices. But actually, he was looking at the way media and cultural studies scholars were drawing on particular uh, understandings of psychoanalysis to theorize subjectivity. Uh, and, and really assuming that the question of the relationship between hypnosis and psychoanalysis had been settled, that is, that there was a founding split or separation made in Freud's work between hypnosis um, and 
the unconscious or psychoanalytic understandings of the unconscious. And what Gary shows in that work is the overlaps, the entanglements, how there are more hesitations uh, in relation to that supposed founding split, opening up the question really for media and cultural studies scholars of the problematic of subjectivity and how we might understand that. And, and some of these ideas come back within contemporary affect theory. So I don't know if Gary is interested in affect theory at all, but some of these ideas about the importance of looking at phenomenon like hypnosis and hypnotic suggestion for understanding affect have come back in the work of Isabella Stengers, uh, Christian Borsch, uh, Steve Pyle, Jan Campbell, uh, Ruth Lees, and, and my own work. So there is a lineage uh, in the kind of deconstructive approach that Gary was developing and some of the work within contemporary affect theory, but it is the work that is really on the margins of affect theory because of the way actually what's mainstreamed is this rather conservative engagement with the psychological and neurosciences. Okay, um, this is just a plug, but um, <laughs> off the back of that, so I've always been interested in how we can think about the problematic of subjectivity within the context of mediation and embodiment. And I think really this is up for grabs and that this is an area that really needs invention, development um, and taking through into the future of the discipline. And Valerie walker down and myself co-edit this journal. We're, we're, we've been trying to stage these debates for some years now. So I really invite you to read the journal, but also publish in it. We're really looking for inventive work that's, that's really trying to think through the problematic of subjectivity within the context of interdisciplinary research. And we try and stay away from psychologists and often when they do send work to us, it's, it's honestly the least interesting. So I hope there's no psychologists in here. Um. Okay, so as I said, I'm interested in minor archives. I'm interested in what gets disqualified by mainstream psychology and what becomes a supposed proper object of psychological study. And I'm calling this a future psychology, and I think it's a future psychology that needs to remain attentive to the traces of what psychology could have been, particularly if it had emerged within a more interdisciplinary context. And when I go back to the minor archives I'm interested in, what I find fascinating is the work then was very interdisciplinary. You had philosophers, medics, economists, engineers working together who were fascinated by hypnosis, voice hearing, telepathy, mediumship uh, and, and, and suggestion, for example. And at that point, the kind of borders and boundaries between disciplines were in formation. So we didn't really have specialised knowledge practices. And people, uh, theorists, practitioners were much more eclectic. There was lots of crossovers between uh, people developing early media technology, technologists and psychic researchers, for example, which I can say more about um, later. And that's just some work I've been publishing in this area, if, if you're interested. Um, I don't know if I will say anything about Grace Cho at this point, but other than to say you must read this book and I should get um, some of her copy, her, uh, not copy, royalties. royalties, thank you Gary, yes, because I keep plugging her book, but if you think why would voice hearing, hypnosis, um, contagion, automaticity really be of interest to me, then read this book because she draws on the activist practices of the Hearing Voices Network who I've been involved with for a long time in order to theorise diasporic media and she develops what she calls um, a diasporic unconscious and a collective psychic apparatus. Um, now this is in the context of uh, women, uh, Korean women who've migrated following the war to America as GI brides, 
who moved from rural poverty to psychosis in America. And this includes her own mother who heard voices. And what she does is develop a really interesting method or practice for seeing what remains unspoken. And this work has been really influential on me. I think it's one the best academic book I've ever written. Um, I've ever written. <laughs> there we go. It's a Freudian slip. It's probably the book I'd like to have written, but of course I didn't. Um, anyway, it's a very interesting book. So just the last five minutes then, just to go back to this concept of haunted data. So I'm trying to develop a method. Um, it's very influenced by Karen Barad, uh, Ray Chow, Derrida, Hansi, or Grinberger, Avery Gordon, and Grace Cho. I can say more about these people in discussion if you want. But it's a very, it's a kind of digital ontology, or what I'm also calling an affective methodology. And I'm interested in how different times become spliced uh, and kind of intersect and cross over within the two controversies that I've been following. Um, and I'm calling them, following Rachel, scenes of entanglement, because you get this really interesting kind of removal of different times and controversies that were once settled. And so I'm working with the concept of haunted data to follow those traces, deferrals, absences, gaps, and their movements within a particular corpus of data, and to remove or keep alive what becomes submerged or hidden by particular regimes of visibility and remembering. And these movements are simultaneously technical, affective, historical, social, political, and ethical, as I hope to illustrate in the book. Um, so what I will do, just to finish, is to, 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 to give you a sense of what I'm doing then. I started with the image of John Barr and then Mr. Von Austin and Hans the Horse. Now, I became interested in this controversy because of the half-second delay, this statement that Brian Massumi draws on and, and that so much work on affect has been invested in. So I went back to... Uh, that the neuroscientific research it's based on. And at the time, there was this controversy emerging in relation to automaticity research and time reaction work that John Barr's work is associated with. And he published in 1996 one of the most highly cited articles that crosses social psychology and cognitive science. You might have heard of it. They primed subjects to walk to a lift more slowly after uh, looking at words associated with ageing on a scrambled language task. So he argued that by priming people with words associated with ageing, they would walk more slowly. There's lots of stuff on YouTube if you're interested in this. It's been replicated many times and there are also lots of non-replication studies. Now in 2012, Stefan Doyen, who's a young uh, Belgian postdoctoral student, tried to replicate the study, but he changed some of the parameters or conditions of the experiment. And it's probably not surprising to us that changing the materiality of the experiment would produce something new or unexpected. But for, for psychologists, you have to eliminate that uh, because replications have to exactly replicate the material culture of the original experiment. But because of the non-replication, and also that the title of Stefan Doyen's article about priming plays on uh, Hans the Horse and John Austin. So there was this comparison made between uh, John Barr and Mr. Von Austin. As I said at the beginning, this led John Barr to go on an angry rant. <coughs> he threw his toys out of the pram did these two blog posts, and then there was this flurry of post-publication peer review, all hyperlinked and extended commentary. That you, and what you can do now is follow, but the blog posts were removed. So this is just an example of someone saying, I cannot find the rebuttal of the Doyen et al. study by Barr anymore. All the different links to it appear to be broken. Perhaps Psychology Today removed it. Can anyone tell me where I can find this rebuttal? Thanks. 
Now, of course, people have recovered the blog posts. I have them as well. You can recover them using digital tools, which I did. Um, they've been circulated on Twitter by different people. So you can, you can follow these links. You can follow the kind of ghostly trails of these blog posts. And what I'm trying to do is really animate and revitalize what gets hidden by the authorized narratives that have come to stand in quite quickly uh, for this controversy, which is not surprising, probably, are authorized by John Barr. If you do a Google search of the controversy, the page rank algorithm brings his, his reading or interpretation of the controversy to the top. Uh, uh, so that's another story that I can talk about. But this controversy removes lots of really interesting issues for media and cultural studies scholars, <coughs> I think, which I might leave hanging because I don't want to go over too far. But these are just some of the questions that I've been interested in. So um, what's all the fuss about? Why the cover-up? Why has Barr's response been removed from the scene? Surely the results of Doyen's study, which has already been cited over a hundred times to date, are significant, even if they failed to replicate Barr's study. What sparked an outpouring of anger and a scathing personal attack by Barr in relation to Doyen, an ambitious researcher who tinkered with the experimental apparatus and interpreted the results by drawing links between studies of priming and an archive of earlier psychological experimentation, that associated John Barr with Mr. Von Austin, the owner of Hans the Horse. And I'm particularly interested in what made Doyen's failed, failed replication study into a media event. So it was picked up by the broadcast media, it was blogged about by a famous uh, science journalist, uh, Ed Young, who writes a blog for Nature and, um, and the National Geographic. It was uh, talked about on CNN News. Uh, it came to the attention of a political comedy show in America. So it really did become a media event. And I'm interested in, in its travels, the kinds of, of afterlives that both of these articles have accrued. Um, and they, they, they open up to multiple leads, crisscrossings, loopings, backtracks, movings, and removings. Um, I think I've probably gone over, so I'm <laughs> going to stop. Um, if you're interested, there are t one article's just come out um, in Theory, Culture and Society, and the other one's about to come out um, in a book called Compromised Data, From Social Media to Big Data. So I can say a bit more about... Um, yeah, I think I'll just leave it there anyway. And, um, thank you.